Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression. I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's event. Uh, the title for it is Journalist Free Expression in Mexico's War on Drugs. I want to thank the uh, three organizations that are co-sponsoring uh, today's event with the Center for Free Expression, and those are the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, Penn Canada, and uh, the Ryerson Journalism Research Center. This is the second of seven uh, public events being sponsored this term by the Center for Free Expression. And I hope each of you has received a copy. Do you have those, Ange? Copy, could you hand those out to people? Uh, we have a, a list of the upcoming uh, uh, events for your uh, interest. And there will also be a sign-up sheet that circulates uh, during the talks if, if you'd like to be on the email list for the Center to receive news of, of um, up from the center as well as notice of, of uh, future events. Uh, if you have any questions about the center, please feel free to ask me afterwards or Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator for the center. As all of you know, this is an increasing dif increasingly difficult time for journalists. Uh, today, uh, journalists face serious risks from the spread of nonviolence uh, from the from nonviolent state actors. Uh, the shrinking rule of law, and resurgent authoritarianism. In 2016, 259 journalists were imprisoned by governments around the world more than any time in the past three decades, and 48 journalists were killed. Um, the country that has the record for the worst treatment of journals, journalists currently is Turkey. A, a third of all the journalists imprisoned worldwide were imprisoned by the government of Turkey. Um, and so, I mean, generally the climate is, is getting more tense and it's certainly being worsened by the unprecedented uh, actions of the new U.S. president uh, who's continuing the anti-media message of his campaign. You know, I don't know if you saw several weeks ago he uh, tweeted that the New York Times, NBC, CBS, ABC, and CNN were, and I quote, the enemy of the American people, um, unquote. Uh, just two days ago, John Schindler, a former National Security uh, Agency uh, analyst and security expert, tweeted, quote, Le I've learned from very reliable sources that Trump, with the help of Russian intelligence, is targeting U.S. journalists. Rough road ahead. Get ready, peeps. Uh, this climate is emboldening governments elsewhere in the world to intensify their attack on journalists. And while, there's, you know, while the situation is worsening, there's a long history, though, of the targeting of journalists. Today's panel is focusing on the situation in Mexico, which, which since 2006 has become one of the world's most dangerous countries for journalists. Corruption, impunity, and censorship from both drug cartels and the government has eroded press freedom and freedom of expression in Mexico. Reporters have been threatened, forced to flee, and ultimately killed. As the conflict has evolved, organized crime groups have found in social media a platform to challenge the state, terrorize the community, and uh, attract followers. We are fortunate today to have two experts to talk with us about what's going on in Mexico. I will introduce both of them and turn the program then over to them. The first um, speaker will be Luis Horacio uh, Najera. Uh, Luis is a Mexican journalist and analyst living in exile in Canada since 2008. Uh, Luis is, um, uh, before fleeing Mexico, he worked as a senior uh, correspondent with Cuidad uh, Juarez, reporting on organized crime, corruption, and human rights. He is currently the Penn Canada writer in residence at George Brown College. He has an enviable list of other awards in recognition of his work. From 2012 to 14, he was the Raul Ray Fellow at Massey College at the University of Toronto. In 2011-12, he was a Southern Journalist Fellow, Journalism Fellow. In 2011, Human Rights Watch awarded him a Hellman Hammett a, a Grant. And in 2010, the Canadian Journalist for Free Expression gave him its prestigious International Press Freedom Award. Lewis is co-author of Democratic Governance in Latin America, a regional discussion. He's been a member of Massey College since 2011 and a former fellow at the Citizen Lab in the, center, in the Canada Center for Global Security Studies. 
Our second speaker is James Cullingham. James is an educator, award-winning documentary filmmaker, a widely published writer, and an experienced national broadcaster. He is currently a professor of journalism in the English and liberal studies at Seneca College and at the Seneca at York campus, and president of Tamarack Productions in Toronto. His documentary films have been screened around the world. James has published articles in a number of leading Canadian newspapers and magazines. In June of 2014, he received his PhD in history from York University, a testament to his persistence, if nothing else. Uh, Slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> his research and teaching deals extensively with the cultural history of modern Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Luis and James. So, uh, I'll turn it over to Luis. Okay, well, uh, hi. Thank you for being here, uh, learning or uh, revising uh, ugly stuff. But it, I think it's necessary to know. Okay, well, my, my presentation is um, uh, more on uh, something that has been my uh, focus of my research since 2004, three, which is how the um, criminal organizations or transnational criminal organizations in Mexico uh, found on internet and social media a great tool for uh, uh, something that I call or, or has been defined as smart power or, or the combination of hard and soft power. So first of all, I'd like to start by uh, showing uh, a photo that this photo was taken around the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Uh, and this is pretty much the idea that we had before of drug dealers, drug lords. The guy with the hat, that was hang, uh, holding the hat is, is uh, Ismael Zambada, uh, El Mayo Zambada. Uh, he's the leader uh, right now uh, on the uh, Sinaloa cartel. And he was also a member of the Juarez cartel. So he's, uh, he, he has been uh, on the run for a long time. And the lady on your uh, right, left, sorry, it's Sandra Avila Beltran, AKA the, the Pacific Queen. Both, uh, she was arrested and in jail in, and now she, she's, she's out of jail. But both of them were uh, well known as, as uh, drug lords. So the idea is b before, before 2000, 2000, 2002, we have this idea or this image of the drug lords. You know, uh, farmers, peasants, people from the mountains uh, with uh, low or no education and uh, very flamboyant, you know, with hats and uh, jewelry and shirts and so on and so on. However, uh, now the situation has changed a lot. Now drug lords, they publicize themselves in Instagram playing golf in the United States and uh, of course, they, they are very careful to you know, pixelate uh, his face. But how do we know that this guy is, is really a drug lord? Well, because he also is uh, posting himself uh, photos of you know, guns and money and saying, OK, this is, I, I'm, 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 I'm here uh, chilling. So this is how, how uh, this is now the situation, how, how the situation changed. Now, what I'm going to do in the following uh, 18 minutes, 16 minutes, I'm going to take you a year by year travel and how this, uh, this evolution of the use of social media. So uh, this began in 2004 when uh, the, the, the war on drugs uh, exploded in Mexico. Uh, and uh, this is a, a a, a, a sign that, or, or, or a cardboard that uh, was found in Nuevo Laredo in the northern, north, west, northeast Mexico. And uh, it's, it's pretty much like a challenge. Police went to a house, they found five bodies, and they found this piece of cardboard saying, okay, please send more of these dumps, we're going to kill them. And, and, and uh, there's a name there, uh, Barbie, a, a nickname. Uh, and Barbie, Edgar Valdez Villarreal, he was originally working for the golf cartel, then he broke with the golf, with the golf and then uh, he joined forces with El Chapo Guzman, and that's how the war at Novo Laredo exploded. But they begin to use this kind of uh, propaganda. And uh, so th this began what is known now as the narco mensajes or narco messages. They put, you know, now they, are, they use big, uh, Canvas, or they they, they 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 put or hang 
big uh, canvas on the streets, but this is how it began. So from that, they, um, we have in 2005 something that uh, it was more directly engaging cyberspace. Um, in, in 2005, when the, the, the infamous group of Los Zetas, this paramilitary organization working for the Gulf Cartel, uh, began to operate, uh, one journalist from Spain came to Mexico and he reported this. So in those years, probably you remember that we, have, we don't have social media, so we have the, the web page and we have the, the comments section. And you have forums where you can you know, chat and so on and so on. But the interesting thing here is in, in, in this web page from a Spanish uh, or from a Spaniard newspaper, uh, one day one guy posted this. And, and, and what's interesting here, and you can see in yellow highlighted, is one name, Garcelo Garza Garza. So in this post, this guy working apparently for Chapo Guzman says, hey, Zetas, we know that Marcelo Garza, who was the director of the state police in Nuevo León, we know that he's working for you. We're going to kill him. OK. So the thing is that um, that was on August the 30th. Uh, then days later, no, I'm sorry, this was it's August 18, 18, year, year, the 18 days after that, on September the 5th, Marcelo Garza was killed. So that threat was fulfilled. And they said, oh, yes, we killed him finally, blah, blah, blah. So that, that began like a, a new uh, interaction between uh, organized crime. Then uh, we also have in 2005, uh, this guy that I told you before, Edgar Valdez, uh, he sent, uh, he recorded this video. Uh, it's kind of, and that began the, this uh, uh, way of, of interrogation, then torture and killed on video uh, of uh, members of another uh, drug cartel. So he began by doing this video, and he sent this video to a small newspaper in, uh, it's called the Kidnap Sun, uh, which is located in Washington, a small population in Washington, small town in Washington. He sent the video there. They watched the video. They were scared. And they sent the video to the Dallas Morning News. Dallas Morning News you know, worked more uh, extensively, extensively on this. And again, we don't have social media on those days. So this video was uh, pretty much available uh, everywhere. That begins this new era of, of uh, again, how uh, portraying or, or, or exhibiting uh, torture and assassinations on, on videos. Then uh, we have 2006, and YouTube is found, and YouTube is alive. And then uh, the first interaction was through these narco corridos or narco ballads, you know, these songs that they extolled life and death of dog dealers and so on and so on. So here we have uh, an kind of a side effect of this. Uh, those singers who were uh, singing ballads for uh, one particular cartel were also threatened through videos because uh, what the drug cartels did was they collect photos from newspapers or websites and they pretty much produce a very basic video on uh, using Windows Media Player, which was the most advanced uh, tool on those days. So, and they produce these videos. And, um, that was a, a different, uh, 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 now YouTube helped a lot this uh, interaction. Then um, we have, um, in 2007, another uh, uh, highlight, or another milestone, if you want to say so. Uh, this is the first video that the uh, La Federación, which in those days were an alliance between the Juarez Cartel, Sinaloa Cartel, and uh, another smaller cartels, they created this alliance against the Gulf Cartel. And uh, the guys on the back, they are interrogating the guys in the front, and they say, oh, Cartel del Golfo, these are your guys. We're going to kill them. But the, this is important because they recorded this video and showed direct, uh, sent them directly to a TV station a major TV station, Televisión Azteca, and they showed the video on the, you know, the nighttime news. So that was, uh, and also, of course, they, they posted on, on, on Facebook, um, on, on YouTube, I'm sorry. Uh, pretty much up to, in 2007, just in 2007, the video has 
more than 70 million views, this video. So that, that again, this is how this uh, violence became uh, viral. Now, 2008 is when the Juarez Cartel, the Ciudad Juarez Cartel, the city where I lived and worked, jumped also into this uh, cyber battlefield. And uh, on um, February, 14, well, February 13, uh, we, and I say we because I was there, a group of journalists, we reported uh, a military operation in a safe house for the, for the Juarez Cartel. February 14, the next day, uh, all the reporters who were uh, on that uh, specific event received this email. And this email is pretty much a threat and says, if you are, you have to stop or we're going to chop your heads, including you and including uh, those police officers and soldiers who participated in, in this raid against us. So that, this is how the, the uh, Juarez Cartel jumped in, uh, into the, uh, the, 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 into cyberspace. Uh, then, uh, 2009, uh, another uh, milestone here, uh, also in Ciudad Juarez, because violence uh, focused, or, or, or Juarez became the epicenter of violence, 2008 to 2010, more than 3,000 assassinations per year. And in 2009, uh, you have, do you remember all, well, f uh, YouTube, you have the video and you have comments. Well, there one, one user called El Puma Original, you can see here in, in the, the, the blue uh, name, the, the ID, the Puma Original, and he was very active posting things on Facebook. So one day he uh, posted uh, the, the, on the bottom side, he was um, asking about information about one guy called Marquitos. Do you know Marquitos, blah, 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 and he's, he's looking, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is that on the same the same day that he's asking for information, later, one guy posted, hey, turn the TV on, we killed him. And the thing is, they, they found this very uh, uh, creative way to kill people right before the news, because they want, to, they want the journalists to broadcast live. Oh, here we are, this guy is dead. So they interact on, on, on internet and say, hey, turn the TV on, we killed him, the guy who you were asking for. So this is another uh, uh, line of, or another layer of, of uh, interaction between drug cartels. Uh, 2010, Twitter was found, was, was, was uh, created and w was operating. And Twitter brought a new player into this, this uh, conflict, which is uh, civil society. Uh, this is um, the newspaper, uh, this is a newspaper in Gualaredo, this is a, they, they pretty much uh, Hitman went to the newspaper and they throw grenades so they burn the, 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 the printing area. But Twitter uh, empowered society. So now society can uh, tweet about, oh, this is a risk situation in this area. Don't come. Don't do this. Uh, avoid this area. And also drug cartels were very active on this, uh, uh, this platform. Also in 2010, a blog called El Blog del Narco was uh, uh, published or was uh, uploaded to the web, uh, and uh, this was very uh, a very specific place where drug cartels begin to send information or submit information to the blog. And the bloggers, there were two people: one guy, uh, young people; uh, one, it was uh, an IT guy. And the person, in, the web administrator, was a, a, a report, a female reporter, uh, Lucy, and uh, she was. Uh, at some point, uh, this blog became very popular because, uh, in 2010, this video was uh, sent and uh, uploaded by El Blog del Narco. In, in this video, presents or, or portrays actual killing of one person. So this guy that you can see there without, uh, uh, without shirt, he's decapitated in front of the camera and he's killed and they say, oh, we're doing this because this guy is working for Los Zetas. And, so, and the video is uh, raw, so you can, you can uh, watch. So bef after this video, the other guys, they say, okay, well, we can do the same thing. And they begin to do killings and killings and decapitating and torturing people live and showing things. And, and I, I strongly don't recommend you to go there. 
uh, because you're going to be very uh, disturbed. So again, this, and, and also when these uh, things happen, Twitter and Facebook exploded in Mexico. Users um, from 100, 146,000 to 1.8 million in, in pretty much months. So anyways, so this would happen in 2010. And, and as social media grow, of course, journalist interaction in social media uh, also grow, and the attention that drug cartels put into social media and uh, watching journalists also grow. So we have 2010. Uh, this is, well, I cut the photo. Uh, I cropped the photo because on, on, on top of this bowl is the head of a journalist. She was the web administrator of uh, another website called uh, uh, Nuevo Laredo en Vivo. She was abducted, tortured, and decapitated, and they placed the head over a keyboard, and then you have this, uh, I don't know, sign that says, oh, yes, I am La Nena, the baby of Nuevo Laredo. I was killed by Los Zetas because I was informing about or reporting about uh, Marines and uh, soldiers. And then ZCC with Miss Losetas. Then also, 2012, another uh, milestone. Uh, this uh, Facebook page, uh, she was a worker, apparently a worker for one drug cartel. And the Juarez cartel found her, hacked her Facebook account, and they posted photos of how she was, as you can see here, she's duct taped. So, and, and then she had, they, they, put most, they posted more photos of her being killed and dismembered on Facebook. So how do they found, trace the account and hack the account? So that's how, this is a proof how they, how smart they are, how uh, tech savvy, tech savvy are, are, are they. Then 2014, again, uh, this is when so civil society really had uh, a big impact because this um, Felina, is the, the, the username, she was a doctor. Nothing to, no, not related with journalism. She was a doctor tweeting about situations of in Nuevo Laredo uh, and Reynosa, uh, risk situations, so on. But for we, we we don't know how, but drug cartels found her, and they again, uh, you can see the the photo uh, on your left is uh, she's alive, but this and then the photo on your right is she's dead and pretty much. Uh, and, and then they hacked the, 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 the account, and uh, they said, oh, uh, Reynosa, follow, uh, close uh, your accounts, don't risk your, your families, as I did it, I ask for your forgiveness, and she was killed. So finally, uh, more than, or, or, or uh, I think more than conclusion, I, I, I have kind of reflections, three things to reflect on this. Uh, the first one is, um, Big brothers are watching. Uh, the, we have organized crime, and it's a big threat for journalism. However, expenditure in technology and electronic surveillance by the government, local, from the state and from federal government in Mexico is exploding. So now, uh, and, and we know that Mexico is not precisely the most uh, uh, fair country or the most honest country, so we have a, a lot of corruption. So we don't know how the government is using these electronic tools. So that's a big if, or, or that, that, that's a big risk for journalists and now civil society, but mostly for, for journalists. Second, black holes are expanding. In, in, during the, the worst of the war, 2008, 2012, we had pretty much Ciudad Juarez, Nuevo Laredo, Tijuana, and so on, so on, so Now we have places, for instance, as Mexico City. Before it was considered like a safe place, a safe city, but now uh, this is also a, a, a place and, and a place of risk for journalists. Uh, in uh, 2015, a photojournalist from Veracruz, and, and, and Jim is going to talk about it, uh, Rubén Espinosa, he fled Veracruz to Mexico City thinking that he will be safe, and he was uh, he was assassinated uh, in Mexico City. And finally, uh, this is the question that I pose here. Is the exception becoming the norm? And that's the big problem. Uh, electronic surveillance has expanded. And, and now, again, this is not an, a criminal intelligence and counterintelligence issue. Last month, the Citizen Lab here in Toronto, uh, they published a report that found how 
scientists and activists against or, or promoting uh, a tax, special tax on uh, soda in Mexico, looking to reduce obesity rates in Mexico, they were um, targeted with government exclusive spyware. So why the government has an interest, we don't know. Or it, it was the government or it was uh, some private sponsor. So that, that's the, 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 the question. Is the exception becoming the norm? And, and when, again, unfortunately, impunity continues. Thank you very much. Um, greetings. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we're in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit River and close to the territories of the Haudenosaunee. Um, I have the greatest respect for Luis and what his colleagues in Mexico uh, have been experiencing. So thank you. And to Jim and Ange and to Tom Hennifer at the Canadian Journalist of Free Expression, thank you for the invitation. Um, my talk is going to um, provide a bit of an overview of what has gone on in Mexico since uh, 2006 and what was a disastrous uh, decision of the then President Felipe Calderón to send the army into Chihuahua and militarize an already failing uh, war on drugs. Uh, since that period, um, Mexico has become, along with Turkey, and a few other places, uh, one of the most dangerous places in the world to um, practice journalism. I invite us all as Canadians to think about the situation carefully uh, in Mexico and to get beyond the uh, stereotypical depictions of uh, nasty but somehow um, exciting uh, criminal figures with alligator skin boots and big hats um, fighting um, equally corrupt forces uh, in either Mexico or the United States. This um, kind of um, cultural phenomena I call the fetish of nar narco cultura. And there are many, many examples of films and uh, television series that I think indulge uh, sometimes uh, with great um, exaggeration, sometimes a little less. As recently as this uh, January, the CBC launched a television series called Pure, uh, based on the uh, somewhat factual um, story of Mennonites working with the uh, drug cartels, uh, their, their companions in northern Mexico, but uh, bringing uh, drugs into the United States, into Canada by virtue of the immunity that they get as being part of a religious society. Denis Villeneuve is a filmmaker whom I admire hugely. Um, I don't admire Sicario terribly. It's his film about the drug war, and it centers on the experience of a very comely drug enforcement officer uh, played by a major uh, actor. Um, Spectre is the last, most recent James Bond movie. And uh, how many people have seen Spectre? It opens in Mexico City, and it's spectacular. But for the first 15 minutes, are, uh, you want stereotypes, you want uh, black and white depictions of Mexican culture and uh, its relationship with the rest of the world. Watch the first 10 minutes of the last Bond movie. Uh, Savages, once again, Oliver Stone is a great filmmaker. Savages is not a great film. Savages is based on a script um, by someone named Don Winslow who we're gonna hear about more. But Savages basically reduces the drug war into a competition between a couple super dudes and the young woman that they share as a girlfriend in San Diego, taking on and beating a drug cartel from Tijuana. Um, it's got some interesting sex, it's beautifully shot, but it's completely brain dead and ethically hollow. Uh, traffic uh, is, uh, a pretty fine film by Steven Soderbergh. Uh, it's not as good as some other stuff we're gonna talk about. It's also based on a better film and a more serious examination of the drug trade because what Soderbergh's company did was buy the rights to a British television series called Traffic, which was um, about heroin, London, Turkey, 
a much better and more serious fictional examination of the reality of the drug trade, but not between Mexico and the United States, between the UK and Turkey. Uh, Luis mentioned some music. Uh, I admire Los Tigres del Norte. Uh, I personally like hip hop. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff out there that has a huge audience that does nothing but glorify the, uh, the leaders of drug cartels. There's a whole uh, category of music now, narco corridos. The corridos were originally based on the stories of the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1920 approximately. Now there are corridos, but they're not about Pancho Villa or Emiliano Zapata. They're about drug dealers. Um, so I think that uh, it's important for those of us who have the extraordinarily lucky privilege of being Canadians to not see the, uh, to get beyond these stereotypes. Canada and Mexico um, have a very, very close link that is overlooked. We're basically the same age. June 19th, 1867, the forces of Maximiliano, the French uh, emperor of Mexico, named by Napoleon III, was executed by the forces of um, Juarez. And uh, less than two weeks later, or approximately two weeks later, of course, Canada came into existence. Since 1993, uh, we are partners with the United States and Mexico in NAFTA. And every year, uh, Los Tres Amigos get together. And you know, Canadians need to get to get the uh, discourse of our uh, selfie photo op and waiting prime minister, who's seen here jogging on June 28, 2016, with the Mexican president uh, Enrique Peña Nieto. Nieto is obviously politically very eager to be seen to be just another normal democratic leader, uh, hanging out with the cool, sexy Justin Trudeau jogging. I mean, I understand the political calculation. We're in a journalism school. What was appalling was that this visit went on on June 28, 2016. I was actually in Mexico that day. And no reporters based in Canada asked any questions about what had happened uh, less than two weeks before in Mexico when eight civilians, not drug dealers, not criminals, were killed at a protest supporting education in uh, rural Oaxaca. One of those uh, was a um, journalist, Alidio Ramos Darate, who was killed in Huchitan, which is a town in southern Oaxaca. When I, I was in Mexico for most of July and August, and uh, I met a number of journalists, some of, which, some of whom you will see pictures of shortly. Uh, I was asked, how come nobody asked Peña Nieto about Oaxaca? No one did. There were students in Montreal who actually raised it. But at a press conference celebrating the achievements of NAFTA, human rights was ignored, apparently. Um, the situation in Mexico, in terms of the overview, is devastating. Um, it gives me no pleasure to say that. Uh, I wish Mexico was uh, functioning, um, and I wish that human rights uh, were more respected. But there is a categorical difference between the situation that journalists face in a place like Canada to what uh, journalists face on a daily basis right now in Mexico. Um, this report comes from 2010. This is a quote from uh, Norte de Ciudad Juarez editor, Alfredo Quijano. We've learned the lesson to survive. We published the minimum. He acknowledged that cartel money flowed easily into local political campaigns. The police are bought off or scared from investigating, and the cartels have expanded into kidnapping and extortion. Quote, we don't investigate. Even at that, most of what we know stays in the reporter's notebook. So um, self-censorship has become a real problem, and many of the major um, um, media organizations which are struggling to cover um, the cartel activity and political corruption in Mexico no longer use bylines. 
And some, as in this case, are saying, you know, we've just walked away from the story. We can't uh, have our uh, reporters killed regularly. More of an overview, uh, this is from very recent, the Inter-American Committee on Human Rights report from t last year. During the last decade, Mexico has become one of the most dangerous countries for journalism. The IA IACHR has noted with concern the increase of different types of attacks and killings of journalists and communicators in Mexico. According to reports received by the Office of the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, there were more than 55 journalists killed between 2010 and 2015, six were killed in 2014, and six more so far in 2015. According to the National Commission on Human Rights, that's Mexico's own national commission, there were 107 journalists killed between 2000 and 2015. That is the context which uh, Luis's colleagues are working in in Mexico today. I had the good fortune last year to meet some extraordinary storytellers. Uh, one of them, Sandra Rodriguez Nieto, was a colleague of Luis's in Juarez. Uh, she has now moved to Mexico City, which is actually the safest place in Mexico. And uh, she's working on a book there about um, the latest tactic, tactic, particularly practiced by the Zetas, which is to kidnap mostly uh, migrants from either southern Mexico or countries like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador that are trying to get north across the American border. They're kidnapped and then their families are extorted. Uh, this is part of the business plan of the cartels. They're branching out from, um, from drug dealing. So that's the subject of her latest book. Her book, La Fabrica del Crimen, I highly, highly recommend. It is translated into English if you don't read Spanish. It's called The Story of Vicente and it tells the story of Juarez through the experience of a 15-year-old boy named Vicente who was hired by a cartel to be, work as a mule and ends up uh, killing members of his own family under the direction of a drug cartel. So it's about the chaos and the moral corruption and the collapse of civil society in Juarez at the worst moment uh, through this young man's story. Um, Norma Trujillo Baez is in Jalapa. Um, some of her colleagues um, have been killed in the last five years. Um, and um, she continues to file on a regular basis for uh, La Jornada uh, de Veracruz. Um, those, of you who are, those of you who are interested in extraction stories and extraction stories involving Canadian mining companies will want to know that part of this uh, brief that um, Norma and uh, her late colleague, Regina Martinez, and uh, their late uh, photojournalist colleague, uh, Ruben Espinosa, were working on is the environmental and human rights impact of mining activity in rural Veracruz. Um, Norma is um, like uh, Noe Zavaleta, uh, protected to some extent by a new system of a panic button and a special uh, police force, although these journalists are very, very skeptical. Uh, in order to respond to the international outcry, the uh, Mexican government, the federal government, has uh, a particular service to protect journalists. Um, it's clearly not working, but um, people like Noe hope that it will. Noe worked with the uh, photojournalist I mentioned, Ruben Espinosa, and that story is particularly shattering because Espinoza was threatened in Veracruz and in the spring of 2015 he decided to go to Mexico City for safety. Uh, whoever it was that got him and it's very very difficult to determine it could have been cartels, it could have been the state government of Veracruz or a police force in Veracruz in collusion with the cartels. Most of these deaths are not solved and the investigations are either immediately discredited or are so suspect that nobody in Mexico believes them. Uh, and in both the case of Regina Martinez and Ruben Espinoza, Regina was killed in 2012, Espinoza in 2015. No one knows. There were journalists 
who were investigators and they are killed. It amazes me that people like uh, Noe continue to produce excellent journalism under these conditions. Um, this book, El Infierno de Javier Duarte, is uh, Noe's uh, investigation of the governor of Veracruz, um, who stepped down in, two th in the November of last year and immediately disappeared. Nobody's heard from him since. He was under, he was under investigation for uh, buying a whole bunch of property in Houston for, mem for himself and for members of his family. There was huge amounts of state funds from Veracruz that disappeared. Well, so did Senor Duarte. He has not been heard from since, but Noe's book came out. Um, and um, Zavaleta was in a program, um, he's a younger uh, man certainly than me, and perhaps even younger than the young Luis. Uh, he was, um, there's a Hispanic uh, journalism foundation that was founded by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is based both in Colombia and Spain. And uh, there's a particular style of investigation that comes from those journalists, and this book is written in this style. So it's like 15 chapters long, and each is a very specific story of something going on in Veracruz during the, the government, the, uh, the governance of Duarte. For those of you who don't speak any Spanish, El Infierno de Javier Duarte, of course, means the hell of Javier Duarte. And the, the journalistic instruction is basically their nonfiction stories that are very separate, but when you read them as a whole, uh, it is a stunning indictment of uh, social and political corruption in, um, in Veracruz. Veracruz, sadly, has become the uh, worst spot to be a journalist in Mexico, not to say that things are great in Guerrero, Guerrero or Oaxaca or uh, Chihuahua, but they're worst of all in Veracruz. Civil society supports journalists, and courageously, this banner appeared on the uh, wall, outside wall of the cathedral. So they're appealing for justice, particularly for Regina Martinez and Ruben Espinosa. There's a lot of excellent work um, that is being done about the situation. People are risking their lives to try and tell the story. Um, Midnight in Mexico by Luis's colleague, Alfredo Cochado, has been optioned uh, to be made into a movie by uh, Hollywood. Cochado was based with the paper in Dallas. He is uh, Mexican-American. It's about um, basically what he sees as the collapse of uh, governance in Mexico since 2006 and what it's like being a journalist in that uh, situation. The Interior Circuit, Francisco Goldman is a Mexican-American poet and journalist and literary scholar, but he took a year off to live in Mexico City, and it's a book about Mexico City, and one of the things that was going on, sadly, during that period of time was an investigation into the disappearance of some teenagers in uh, La Zona Rosa in downtown of Mexico City. So the book is an investigation of that, written in English, very, very powerful book. I mentioned La Fabrica del Crimen, English title, The Story of Vicente. Um, Jennifer Clement's uh, novel, Prayers of the Stolen. Jennifer is now the head of Penn Mexico, based in Mexico City. She writes in English, and her novel, uh, Prayers of the Stolen, is about young women in uh, Guerrero, outside of Acapulco, who are kidnapped basically to serve as sex slaves to um, the drug cartels. Um, you know, it's a shame to stress all these negative things, but I want to go back to that picture of our prime minister with the Mexican president. Democracy and human rights in Mexico are not functioning at all according to the standard that Les Tres Amigos would like to dupe us into believing. Um, now, Winslow. This guy was an officer with the DAA, <clears throat> Drug Enforcement Agency, and I believe an FBI agent. Now he's a novelist. People who are, are done a lot of in-depth research about this think that some of the best information on how the cartels work and how they collude with government, police, and military authorities on both sides of the border are in these 
novels. Um, the Power of the Dog and the Cartel together are a 900-page novel, which is the study of the relationship between a drug enforcement officer from the United States who is bicultural and binational with his counterpart, a binational, bicultural drug dealer from Mexico. They grew up as friends, and then professionally, they are, at various times, colleagues or combatants. Uh, a fascinating, fascinating study, and uh, perhaps I was decided to tell the story this way, because if he did it journalistically, he might not survive, or he might not have got the kind of access that he did. I just saw this documentary, I'm going to conclude. Um, El Paso was released last fall in Mexico City by Everardo Gonzalez. It's about Mexican refugees in the United States, particularly El Paso, most of them being journalists who have fled Mexico for their lives. Cartel Land was nominated for an Oscar. Reportero is a P PBS documentary that was done for the Independent Lens Strand for PBS directed by Bernardo Ruiz, and there's a courageous uh, journalist in Mexico City working for Al Jazeera, Andalusia Noel. Uh, she's doing mini docs, 12-minute pieces. A recent one, uh, journalists are under attack in Mexico, death in Veracruz, is noteworthy because among the journalists featured in that particular report are Ruben Espinosa, the photojournalist who uh, was killed. Um, following the completion of that documentary. Those of us who are concerned about this issue, whether we're journalists, activists, or both, um, there are lots of people trying to bring this situation to light. Nuestra Parente Rendición is an organization of journalists in Mexico. Our apparent surrender, not so apparent, periodistas de FP, journalists on the march, Articulo 19, Articulo 19 is the freedom of speech uh, article from the International Convention on Human Rights, I believe. Uh, that's the Mexican organization based uh, on free speech uh, in Mexico. Animal Politico is a, uh, a very um, savvy uh, political and media blog. Committee to Protect Journalists, Penn Mexico, Penn Canada, Penn International, etc. Um, I hope that um, those of us who are here can um, see through uh, the smoke that whether it's Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau or Enrique, Enrique Pinieto or major corporations that benefit from NAFTA, you have to, I think we have to break through this illusion that Mexico is, you know, normal, if that means anything. The situation is dire, the human rights situation in Mexico. And unfortunately for journalists, you know, uh, it simply is one of the least safe places on the planet to practice journalism is Mexico. Thank you very much. James and Luis uh, would be happy to answer questions or respond to comments that any of you have. Is, does anyone have a question you'd like to ask? Um, Ange has a microphone, so if you can just uh, Use that. Thank you. Uh, excellent talks. Thank you to both of you. Um, my mind immediately turns to the idea of solution, and you've probably had this question a million times, but what about the legalization of drugs? That seems obvious, and it's interesting that Jimmy Carter, former president of the United States, Vicente Fox, former president of Mexico, are both on the record repeatedly and publishing in places like the New York Times and the Globe and Mail about that. Um, so um, is it going to be a solution? And when it comes to some of the drugs that you know, these, um, the cartels and the people they're working with are extremely sophisticated and they're diversified. Um, and some of the drugs that are uh, being trafficked now, like methamphetamine, is not something that I think many people would consider to be a casual, safe, uh, recreational drug. So there are questions, but in terms of cocaine, marijuana, I mean, legalization would help, but um, what, are the, what are these entrenched cartels going to move to next? It's like telling the mafia you can't 
there's no point in trafficking booze anymore. It's been legalized. It didn't put the mafia out of business. Jenny? Um, yes, thank you very much uh, for the talk. I'm married to a Mexican, so I know, <laughs> unfortunately, much about the situation. Um, and I also read, you probably read it, Linda Dable's book on Digna Ochua, the murdered human rights activist. And that really opened my eyes to the fact that um, people promoting democracy can't turn to the government for support. So I understand <laughs> this uh, uh, reluctance to see this federal police force as, as a real, you know, a real form of protection. I know human rights lawyers in Latin America often have, or sometimes have, private security. Is that something that La Jornada or other um, news news media is looking at? Is that a way that you know, until there's sort of more systemic change in protections, you know, that's a you know, sort of very, you know, immediate thing that could be done for protection, or is it being done? I don't know. No, I don't think it's going to work. No, okay. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, I, <clears throat> sorry, I, there, there's have been, for instance, in Chihuahua, at some point uh, early in the war on drugs, uh, some journalists were uh, protected by the police. And uh, even for uh, police officers working as private security on, out of uh, their, their shifts, and uh, it didn't work. I mean, how can you work as a journalist with sources, protect your sources, and so on, so you have, if you have a, a guy uh, taking care of you? Now, uh, about the uh, legalization of drugs, uh, Juarez had this problem 2008, 2011, uh, and, and it was pretty much the war to conquer the, the, the border, to, to, to get access into the United States, and mostly to, to traffic cocaine. Uh, Sinaloa and Juarez, they had a kind of, well, Sinaloa won, and they took control of the city. But now, violence in Juarez is, is, is rising again. Why? Because now uh, El Cartel de Jalisco Nueva Generación is moving uh, methamphetamines into the border. And uh, the Juarez cartel is fighting against them because, as you know, methamphetamines are more uh, invasive drugs. So drugs that kill your customer uh, quickly. Meanwhile, cocaine is more like socially accepted, cool, and you can be an addict and, or, or a casual user or casual uh, addict, I don't know. Uh, so they are trying to protect the market. So it's really hard. If you legalize marijuana, what about cocaine? And then if you legalize cocaine and marijuana, what about methamphetamines? If you legalize methamphetamines, cocaine, what's next, as, as James said? And, uh, and the other thing is, I mean, it doesn't matter if you legalize drugs in Mexico if your biggest market is still requiring uh, that uh, supply of drugs. So it's, it's really hard. That's the question over here. Um, this is um, partly for Luis and partly for James. When I saw the presentation, I thought how powerful it might be to be invited to or to try to get in to mix this presentation of the two of you uh, to Google, to Facebook, to Twitter, to the corporate offices, uh, to members of parliament who might have a way of speaking to the Trudeau government about owning up to the human rights issues that they're... Uh, ignoring, um, you know, reversing it so that the, the context is set up first by James and then the details of how these corporations are complicit and how their business model was served by the cartels posting this stuff and suddenly the use of Twitter and Facebook increased by whatever, 600% or whatever the numbers were that you said. Obviously, that w it was in their interest to do nothing, just as it was interest their interest to do nothing about the fake news that helped get Trump elected. They are being held to account around fake news and Trump. There are things going on. There is change afoot within these social media organizations in relation to that. So I would think there's an opportunity here uh, in this partly empty room, which fortunately has been videotaped. You know, there's, there's, there's some, this, this presentation has legs that you maybe haven't thought of. Well, and, and 
just for your information, in 2010, when I came to Toronto to, to receive the, the CGFE award, I was invited to go to Ottawa, and I spoke to several Amnesty, uh, UNESCO, uh, even I went to uh, well, now Global Affairs Canada, uh, and I spoke with uh, members of the Mexico office. Uh, does that change something? Not that I know. So, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it will be great if we have if we have a greater audience and more extended audience. But I, I think my question is here, or my reflection on that is, who really wants to change things? Remember the the, the this book of uh, Darren Asimoglu, uh, Why Nations Fail. You have extractive economics, and you have the other economies. So, how? interest are those powerful companies to really change things in these kind of places, either Mexico or Africa or I don't know. That That's, I don't know, I'm going really far. James, did you want to comment on that? Well, um, I think that it's the change comes from inside people's minds and hearts, and we have that option as individual citizens. Um, and I think that we try and get this story out as best we can, and if somebody wants to put it on Facebook, that would be wonderful. Um, I, you know, uh, full disclosure, I'm a national director of the Canadian Association of Journalists, and Luis is going to be talking about journalism in Mexico at our annual conference in Ottawa on April 29th. So, I'll... All of you come. Uh, and uh, so I just think that we have to keep beating the drum. I think generally, Canadians need to, I have to repeat myself, understand that there is no, no normalidad and democracia in the way that we like to think of it in Mexico. Um, it's not a country like Canada or the United States in very, very dramatic and dire ways. Well, and, and part of the challenge is I'm sure the Prime Minister and the government of Canada and the senior officials are well aware of those facts and mm -hmm. choose to ignore them. Yes. Is that an unfair I, I think that's an accurate characterization. I think that if, uh, if our current Prime Minister or the previous one had wanted to point out at any time in the presence of a Mexican president about the attack on journalists and the human rights situation in Mexico. They had many, many opportunities, and they didn't do it. OK. Yeah, they were really great presentations. Um, it's also part of neoliberalism. And uh, I think that um, it's not in their best interest. They, they, Trudeau and the liberals and whatever governments in power, they just want to look good. but. I think it's up to individuals as ourselves to expose them and to inform ourselves about what's going on and not fall for some of these uh, films that project um, the uh, drug cartels as, oh, they're, they're, look, they're, they're great, the they're, they're clothes they wear, the, the, the money they have, and all these kinds of things. Yeah. Anyone else? Have a comment. Yes, in the back. And by the way, uh, the podcasts of James and Luis's presentations will be on our website and will be on our YouTube channel. So if you have anyone else you want to direct them to, please do so. Um, I have more of a general question. Um, I'm a journalism student here at Ryerson. And I know there's a lot of people in my program that hope to take their careers international and be able to cover news in different places all over the world. And I guess I'm just asking from the opinions of you both what you would really have to say to young journalists now that are hoping to um, find themselves, find the industry and hope to take their careers internationally, knowing that it's not always a, uh, a safe place for journalists, a safe space, um, what you would just have to, to say to young journalists now. You first. <laughs> well, that's a great question. Do you want the truth or do you want the Canadian truth? She's a journalism student at Ryerson. She wants the truth. OK. Um, well, you have a hard 
future. Because unfortunately, well, the news industry is, 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 we don't know what's happening in the news industry. Just in Canada, since to November 2015 to now, more than almost 1,500 jobs have been lost. Uh, if you want to go internationally, well, uh, I think one of the, one of the, one of the suggestions that I have is uh, one of the problems that I see when, when I was in Juarez, I, I, I saw Canadian, American, European journalists coming to Juarez, and they come with this mentality of, oh, I'm just here to visit, and I'm just here to show you how powerful I am. So you have to be humble. Yeah, that's the word that I was looking for. Be humble. Because you go there with your entourage and your protection and your insurance and da, 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 da. And uh, yeah, you maybe go and look at some reality because you stay there for a month, two weeks, one week, I don't know, and you bring with this notion. But you have to be humble in order to sit and talk and listen, especially to listen to people, not to look for your answers that you have in your mind already. So you have to go there and sit and talk face to face to people, learn about them, and then say, OK, no, now I got you. And then you can, I, I think that will be uh, more honest uh, journalism. Yeah. James, did you have any comment on that? Um, I think that's a wonderful statement that Luis made. I think one has to have one's eyes open and think very carefully about the risks that you're prepared to take and understand that uh, you're dealing with, uh, I mean, I just speaking in my own career, I've worked in Palestine, I've worked in South Africa, I've worked in Mexico, I've worked in a number of places that are uh, incredibly sketchy compared to what I experience. I've worked in First Nations communities in many parts of Canada where the social and economic conditions are absolutely unlike anything that I uh, ex have experienced as a guy who grew up between Toronto and Florida and France and Switzerland. Um, so I think being aware that you are coming from a position of privilege, never forgetting that, and understanding that the people that you're maybe doing stories about if you're working internationally are gonna continue to live in that context and you have to listen, 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 and be very observant of the culture and the language and be very clear about what you don't know. And every hour you're working in a situation like that, your ignorance will only grow. <laughs> what, you, what you begin to understand is uh, very small and you have to be honest about that. Um, so, uh, I mean, I encourage you or anyone student at Ryerson or Seneca where I teach or anywhere else to get out there and, and do important journalism. Um, but be very clear, if it's a matter of your personal safety, what are you prepared to risk? I mean, it's, as a documentarist now, it's almost impossible to get insurance. Uh, if you're not an employee of a major organization, you're not going to get insurance. Um, those of us who have families, that becomes pretty serious. Uh, so you have to uh, you have to think about that um, carefully. Um, so uh, keep your eyes open. But uh, I agree with Luis. That's a, a very very appropriate and um, powerful question. The final comment, bringing it back to Mexico, for me would be: I have, as a documentary filmmaker, an opportunity and context to make a film based on some of the research that I've been doing. I don't know how to do it with having any level of comfort that the people that I'm dealing with leaving behind in Mexico are going to survive. That's why I haven't started making the film. Yes. This is for Luis. Uh, it's connected to the last question. You said, do you want to know the truth or do you want to know the Canadian answer? Could you tell us what, you're, what you meant by the Canadian answer? Because it may be the one that they're being taught. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, it, it's kind of an irony. Uh, because, uh, you know, here in Canada, we Canadian, because now I am a Canadian citizen too. So we are, you know, you, we like tres amigos photos, you know, smiling prime minister running with the smiling <laughs> Mexican president. And everything is great. And how beautiful Mexico is, the beaches, the food. That's amazing. 
actually, I had I have a, a presentation when I when I talk about uh, these issues, but in a more depth uh, uh, way. Uh, I start that present spoiler alert. Is uh, I, I begin my presentation by showing you a photo of Cancun, and say, "Oh, you like Can Cancun? Okay. Close your eyes." Think about the, the waves, and I make songs, and people, oh, do you relax, feel the sand, and then I change the slide, and they open your eyes. And when they open your eyes, they watch three heads, and they say, welcome to Mexico. This is Mexico. So that's a big difference. So I, I, I think that the, this Canadian experience uh, has been extended up to the level of the government when the government knows, because I think they know, of course they know, but do they really want to do something? There's interest that we know politics and so on and so on, but, but I think that from time to time, I think it will be good if someone in the Canadian government says, you know what, we have to do something. Maybe they will do it, maybe we don't, but from time to time it's good. Like, Days ago, the prime minister started saying, oh, misogyny and uh, anti-Semitism, uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, from time to time, it's good to do that. But also, it's good to do it not only inside Canada. It's only good to do it outside Canada. For instance, with a commercial trade uh, partner, which is very important, which is Mexico. So that's the difference between the. I haven't read all the answered, so if the prime minister or any of his cabinet colleagues have spoken to this directly, but I, as a Canadian citizen, I'm shocked and disappointed that no representative of the Canadian government, to my knowledge so far, has spoken out in defense of Mexico and the rhetoric of the current administration. I mean, the wall was already being built. There were 700 miles of it already. Uh, it's not Trump's idea. Uh, but uh, certainly the rhetoric around completing the wall, he's not inventing the wall, completing it, and just the, um, the demonization of Mexicans generally uh, in some of this rhetoric. I mean, why doesn't our prime minister say, hey, there are three partners in NAFTA, and uh, we have empathy with the government and the people of Mexico, and we don't want to see them targeted that way by our other partner, the United States. I don't think that would be hard to say. I don't think a Canadian politician has said it other than the leader of the New Democratic Party who has said that, actually. I had a question for you, and that is, what resistance or opposition is building in Mexico? What uh, is there, I mean, I assume there are political forces or others who are trying to deal with this under very adverse circumstances. What's the, what's the situation? Well, AMLO is coming back. I mean, the, the leftist sort of social democratic politician who is not a young man anymore and has, what, lost two presidential campaigns? He's got a 20-point lead in, in, in the polls right now. So uh, he was, what, mayor of Mexico City, yeah. governor of a state. Tabasco, was he governor? Yeah. No, um, he wasn't governor. Uh, he was politician there, but yeah, he was the mayor of Mexico City. So I can't say whether he's corrupt or not, but he's certainly in Mexican politics a democratic socialist, and now he's leading. So maybe Mexico, part of what the response will be to go neither with PRI or with PAN and to give another party a shot. But uh, I think the situation is very much, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, the, the PRI, after 71 years, of being in the government, they were defeated by the National Party, which is center of right, uh, Vicente Fox. Then everything changed. The, one of the biggest changes that this uh, demo, real democracy exercise, uh, democratic exercise uh, brought into Mexico was that power was fragmented. Because before was, you know, the pre was the, pretty much the, like uh, the king, and you have these fields in every state, the governor was the, the, the lord, and so on, so on. But then the king was out, so I mean, the, 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 these lords became mini kings in their own states, and that created a lot of problems. Like Duarte. Yeah, for Duarte, for instance. And now the other problem is, you you have a state like Sinaloa where the Chapo and everybody's really governed by. Pan by a National Action Party, and the border state, which is Sonora, 
also a big hub for drug dealers, is governed by the PRI. So this also comes to money, into campaigns, dirty money, and so on and so on. So now you, have, you don't have coordination between governments. You have uh, politics into that. You have narco politicians. So it's extremely complicated. Now, the biggest, I mean, the real problem of all this situation is something, it's called chronic violence, which is violence that is not reported, violence that is affecting families, violence that is not these massive shootings of people on the streets. It's the, the, the people who are suffering because they cannot put, I don't know, they lost one tire every three weeks or the car battery is stolen every week or every month. So that's, that's one of the biggest problems in Mexico. How, now, how society is reacting to that, I don't see like a grassroots movement trying to change that, and that's the biggest problem. Any other, yes. Uh, good afternoon, I'm a student from uh, the School of Media. Uh, I just wanted to comment that really quick. Uh, it's very true what you said. Uh, like, my tires actually, my family uh, car tires got stolen like inside the garage. And yeah. uh, who, are you, who are you gonna tell? If you tell the police, the criminal knows you told them, right? So if it, if it, if it happens at that scale, it's gonna happen in a greater scale. Yeah, the, the, the rate of non-denounced uh, crime in Mexico is, I think every, only two of 100 crime uh, events, criminal events, are denounced in Mexico. And from those two, only from two became the 100%. So the, from the 100%, I think 5% is really prosecuted and has a, like a sentence. So. Yeah. Or, or they put someone else in jail just yeah. to put someone in jail. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Sorry, I can't resist one more question. Um, I've recently spent some time in Mexico, and in the state that I was in, they were touting statistics about how safe that state was. Uh, that state has a lower murder rate than uh, the state of Vermont, was one of the things that came up while I was there. When I spoke to people in that town, uh, in a town in that state and said, you know, how safe do you feel? Uh, is it a safe town? They all said, yes, 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 yes. This is a safe, safe, safe place to be, a safe place to visit. And I finally spoke to someone else who said, do you know why it's safe? And I said, no. And they said, because the drug lords there. Mm -hmm. And they want somewhere nice for their kids to go to school. And they want yep. somewhere safe to entertain. Uh, is that? True, yeah. roughly speaking. Yeah, yeah. Actually, before the, the the war on drugs, one of the consequences of the war on drugs is it, it broke a lot of non-written rules. For instance, one of the unwritten rules was there's specific cities, Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey, the largest city in Mexico, were considered as a neutral zone. So. If you're a drug lord, OK, you live in Sinaloa, but your family lives in Monterrey, and they go to a very prestigious uh, high school or school, maybe with the kids of another guy who are you are f fighting in the mountains. But that's perfectly safe. Nobody touched anybody. And, and actually, one of the unwritten rules before that was um, you don't mess with the family. And, and just a quick story, uh, I remember it. My, in the 90s, when the when Damao Carrillo, the one of the, the founder of the Juarez cartel, died, uh, the, the 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 Tijuana tried to came into Juarez. Uh, one day, we reported uh, uh, an arrest of a you know middle level uh, drug lord, and uh, the guy you know this photo op when the guy is presented with guns and da da da. da. So okay, well we went there, took photos, blah blah blah, and then at some point they said guys. You're done? The, 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 the criminal said, OK, are you done? And they're like, what? They said, turn off the cameras. Turn it off, please. Oh, OK. No photos, no comments. Yeah, I just want to say something. I know. No, he said, 
Family is forbidden. It's, it's, uh, yeah, you, you, you are not allowed to touch the family. And, and he looked at the police officers and said, I know who you are, and you took things that you shouldn't be taking. I'm okay with taking my money. I'm okay with taking my drugs and my guns. But you took my children's toys, you took my wife's jewelry, and you took my hats and my, my cowboy boots, which are extremely expensive. So I know who you are. You will pay for that. And we're like, what? The thing is that that special group begin to be, they were killed systematically months later. Why? Because they broke these unwritten rules. So now it's safe. Yeah, now I think they are reorganizing themselves and say, OK, yeah, we need to find safe places for our families. But you said this changed after the war on drugs was in it? Yeah, because the war on drugs, uh, uh, you, before that, you have six major criminal organizations, five or six. When the, dro the war on drugs began, these fractions a lot. Now it's 11 or 12 or 15, maybe. So now there's no control. It's hard to negotiate. And so, so, so there's all the, these rules. For instance, you, you don't kill the family in the past. Now they are killing mothers, fathers, grandmothers, and whoever is at the house. Um, I think in terms of sanctuaries in Mexico, I think they exist. I think that's accurate. Um, in Winslow's novels, uh, I've known what the current situation is in Cuernavaca, but it's well known that there are a lot of major uh, cartel jefes yeah. who have beautiful homes in Cuernavaca, as did Cortes, for that matter. And nothing ever happens in Cuernavaca. Uh, no one seems to know why. Because uh, they're, they are safe there. And that's, what, 40 kilometers from downtown Mexico yeah. City? Um, and uh, there are compounds in places, parts of Sinaloa, that have been described. Um, and also, I think that in terms of American authorities and American complicity, how is it that these people and their families are attending elite schools and universities in Texas and California, and they're all clearly identifiable, and they belong to like the finest golf clubs yeah. and other things? And it may not be the top dog, but it's other members of his family. Um, in terms of civil society, I just want to say, I mean, me uh, gusta mucho México. I don't know Veracruz very well, but you can see there's lots of people who don't trust the state, who are very active and have uh, organizations that support journalists and are concerned about free speech and human rights, and they're very active. But unlike a Canadian, they're never going to do that in any partnership with a municipal or state or federal organization because they're not to be trusted. Oaxaca, which I know better, Oaxaca has an extremely active and visible civil society. But once again, it's like almost at the neighborhood level. They, they, they don't trust, and this is I think part of the breakdown in Mexico. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Luis, but right-minded people have completely lost their faith in state authority. Yeah. yeah that's the problem. I, I, and I think, uh, to summarize this, I think right now we are seeing the transition between uh, before was uh, threats to press freedom, but now this is moving towards threats to freedom of expression, which includes civil society, and that's the, the risk for Mexico, that's the bigger risk. Because now, before that, were well, police officers, journalists, people who were you know, working on these things. But now, this is expanding into civil society. And, and that's, that's one of the risks that this criminal evolution is, is, is moving towards. So I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Luis and James for a very interesting presentation.